BG Media presents High Tech Sunday. On today's episode of High Tech Sunday, our hosts, Dr. Mark Vaughn and Lango Dean, sit down with artist, visionary, and owner of the Tory Sudan fashion brand, Tory Sudan, for a conversation on the passion for fashion. Up first is Corning Incorporated's manager of technical talent pipelining, Dr. Mark Vaughn. Next is Career Communication Group's Senior Technology Editor, Lango Dean. Finally, our esteemed guest, Tori Sudan. Sudan's love for fashion began at just nine years old, when her mother taught her to make dresses, which led to her designing prom gowns for her friends as a teenager. She pivoted to footwear after studying abroad in Italy and saw a demonstration from a master shoemaker. After graduating from Spelman College, studying at the famed Parsons School of Design, and interning with Tommy Hilfiger, Sudan debuted her first collection in 2011. Today, the Tory Sudan brand is about timeless sophistication and fearless style. And without further delay, High Tech Sunday, featuring Dr. Mark Vaughn and Lingo Dean. Well, thank you so much, Brandon, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of High Tech Sunday. Such a great pleasure to have the opportunity to spend some time with you as we continue to introduce to some and enjoy with everyone the conversations that we've had with people around the stem sphere, if you will. And uh, that is certainly the case today as we welcome Tori Sedan. And I love how uh, the capsule was made about artist and visionary passion for fashion. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. Welcome, Ms. Sedan. How are you? Thank you. I'm great. Great to be with you. Awesome. And I'm telling you, there's a, a background that I'm looking at uh, for those who may not be uh, seeing video. Uh, and there's all kinds of cool uh, designs. Uh, uh, the, I see shoes, I see handbags. I can't wait to learn more uh, about the passion for fashion that really led to this uh, collection of yours. But we're going to start with first things first. And I got to tell you, the first thing that came to my mind when I uh, realized that we were having a conversation about passion for fashion. I was like, what does that have to do with high tech? Trust me, we're going to uh, make the connection. We're going to talk about the intersection later on in the broadcast. So you are going to have your question answered. But for now, what we really like to do for the opening round is to learn more about uh, the guests that we uh, have the pleasure of welcoming. So can you just take a few minutes and help us get to know you better? What's your background and how did it come to you or or why did you choose to pursue the path that you did and when did you know that this was the career for you well I'll start by focusing on your word chose I don't feel like I chose this career at all I feel like there are certain assignments that are planted in everyone and I just so happened to have discovered mine at an early age. My mother taught me how to sew when I was nine years old. And first of all, it's a family tradition. Uh, my grandmother, great grandmother, all made clothes and quilts and were so creative. And it was something that my mother wanted me to, to know how to do. And so um, spending time sewing over the course of many years, I realized that it was something that I really, truly loved to do. It was something that no one had to tell me to do. I just loved it. Uh, so I just took that in for years. You know, as you mentioned, when I got to high school, I started making clothes for my classmates. Uh, made gowns and suits and all kinds of things. Um, back at that time, the MC Hammer pants were popular. And so <laughs> I made a lot of MC Hammer pants. Yeah, so I really started and knew at an early age what my assignment was. Uh, it didn't go smoothly, um, you know, like no uh, successful career path. 
there were definitely some detours, but I'm really happy to be where I am. And I'm grateful to be able to live in my truth and to be following along the path that was set for me. I really appreciate that perspective, that it's uh, it, it's not that you chose the path, the path kind of chose you, and and you uh, made the choice to align with that direction. And, and when you say that, it, it really does sound like we're invested with uh, the gifts and talents that we need in order for us to uh, succeed along that pathway that has been uh, uh, foreordained for us, if you will. And so, when you think about it that way, I'm like nine years old and you are sewing. I listen, I, I might have known what thread was when I was nine and, and right. you're already you're already in it. And then by high school, uh, basically, you're starting your own line, you, you know, with the prom gowns and whatnot. And so when did you realize that it was more than just the family tradition, that it was really a passion of yours? Well, when I got to high school, I really hit a crossroads because as a child, you know, you can just sort of do things that you enjoy and it's all kind of innocent. You don't have to really think about it like a career path. For me, it was just something that I truly enjoyed. But towards the end of high school, I was forced to really make a decision on, you know, what am I truly going to be doing in life? And at that time, uh, this is one of the detours I had. I didn't see a clear path to getting there. Um, at that time, it was difficult to become a designer. The internet had not yet been uh, invented and it was difficult to reach your customers if you wanted to build and scale a brand. You know, the normal pathway was to work for a big designer and hope that they choose you and take you along the ranks. And we already know how difficult that is for African-American designers let alone launch your own brand. So I really didn't see how it would work. And I was really discouraged, actually, uh, just really kind of challenged by what I should be doing in life. So I decided to, um, after being exposed to historically Black colleges, my godfather took me to Howard University's homecoming. And if you take any a young person to an HBCU homecoming, you really don't have to sell it anymore. So <laughs> I knew that I was going to go to a Black college. Um, I felt like that was the next step that I needed to take, even though I didn't see a fashion outlook in attending an HBCU. I knew that there was something that I need to get needed to get from an HBCU. And I ended up going to Spelman. I was introduced by my sister's childhood friend who attended Morehouse. He invited me to go down there and stay with his girlfriend. And I knew that I, would, I belonged at Spelman. So that was really important for me because Spelman really built my character. Spelman really mm -hmm. emboldened me to not think small and to understand that an assignment that was given to me was my responsibility, not just for me, but also to make a contribution to the world, to our community, to our culture. And, you know, there's a phrase that is said at Spelman is that when you go to Spelman, you make a choice to change the world. And I really felt that. I really felt that I needed to do something pivotal. So going to Spelman, you know, it took a couple of years. My roommate that I was living with at the time shared with me that she wanted to compete in the Miss Maroon and White pageant, which is the big Miss uh, Morehouse homecoming pageant, and she needed a dress. And so I decided to make her the dress. I offered to make her the dress. Before then, she didn't even know that I knew how to sew, but she trusted me. And at that moment, I felt like I was giving to her, but it was a really big gift for me because when I saw my dress on a stage, that really just hit me. That really just showed me that what I had to offer was um, meaningful and it could happen for me. It made me feel like it could really happen for me. I could one day own my own brand. And so 
from there, I decided to study abroad in Paris because that was the most amazing place for fashion in my eyes at that time. And I had a wonderful inter internship at a uh, public relations firm in Paris. And I just experienced so many just shows and exhibits and just, I just really immersed myself in fashion uh, from a Parisian perspective. And for me, I was just sold. And in addition to that, I also went to Italy and I was then introduced to shoes. So to me, it just all came together. And for me, what that was is, you know, a young African-American girl from Connecticut who had never traveled outside the U.S. at that time. For me, everything was like this big discovery. I mean, everything from the buildings to the bridges, everything that I saw when I came across shoes, uh, Italian made shoes. I was just, just, you know, blown away at the level of craftsmanship and the level of quality and detail that they put into their products and how it's, it's not only a product, it's part of their culture. It's part of their heritage and their pride. And so I knew that one day I would start a shoe line. Wow. What I tend to do as I'm listening to uh, our guests is uh, capture headlines. And so there were a few that stood out for me as you were uh, sharing what really is your testimony, in, in my opinion. Um, you said that the HBCU experience that you had there at Spelman did a number of things for you. Uh, in particular, you were emboldened to not think small. And I'm, I, it, it just is stunning uh, how important uh, that kind of a um, reality is to opening the doors of the world to you because of the fact, like you said, a lot of us have the same kind of, of history, as you mentioned, haven't traveled much, definitely uh, never thought about international travel, but not only have you traveled, but you've lived abroad. So you've been an expat, you've gotten that exposure to different culture and it's informed your work uh, but the seeds were were planted or the seeds that have already been planted were watered while you were there at Spelman and then the thing that you mentioned uh, as far as Spelman is concerned uh, uh, you make the choice to change the world you took that seriously you took it to heart and uh, you are uh, you said you're living your truth in a way that is absolutely it sounds like allowing you to make the change be that change if you will uh, and so I really found those those words inspiring and and thinking about inspiration I wanted to touch back really quickly on something that you said that it wasn't a choice it was uh, my words kind of a calling kind of uh, something that was already there invested in you and so we talked about uh, the spirituality component um, with our guests, and invariably, everyone has had that. And it sounds like that's the case for you, too. So how has your spiritual side, your spirituality, informed your path as you've been on this journey? Well, to a great deal. Um, I can say that, you know, when you accept your assignment, I feel like, and it's your destiny, then things tend to manifest in a way that is more than you could have done on your own. And I recognize that. Uh, the connections that I've made over the years because I went ahead and embraced uh, what I was meant to do, I think is just, it's just, I can't even believe certain things happened. Uh, for example, it's really hard to find a factory in Italy. First of all, I didn't speak the language, okay? I went out there looking to make connections. I didn't know one Italian person and I had no connections. And so for me to have been in that position to now having my shoes and handbags made in the same factories that Chanel is made in, Dior, Manolo Blahnik, et cetera, to me is just, there, there's no way that I could have done that independently. I feel like uh, it was definitely divine. The connections that I've made have definitely been divine. And one of the things in the beginning that really showed me that is 
When I decided to become a shoe designer, I explored having my production in different countries. However, I landed back to the Venetian area, not just Italy, the Venetian area, which is where I first discovered beautiful Italian shoes. And so, you know, I'm just like, how does that happen? How do I end up back here producing my line and also connecting to the most amazing, talented factories? I knew that that was that was divine. And so thinking about divine and 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 I know that it sounds dramatic. I, I'm still looking at those shoes behind you and and that handbag and and they they look divine. I am definitely going to uh, make sure that we get the information uh, uh, out to folks uh, because it, it's it's a uh, it really is something uh, that I'm hopeful we'll be able to actually benefit from uh, as as we uh, look at the line that you have. But let's let's dig a little deeper then about um, uh, how it is that this passion for fashion uh, has become uh, what it is that we now know as uh, your line. So you talked briefly uh, about your background and how you got started in fashion. And, uh, you know, there are lots of people who have the, the dream that you have of creating beautiful clothes for others to wear. You talked about how it felt to see that that uh, gown uh, on uh, the stage uh, during that competition while you were in college. Can you tell us about the process of how a nine-year-old girl from Connecticut ends up actually creating this amazing boutique that is Tori Sedan. How, how can people, specifically young people, get started in this kind of career? Well, I think the key for me, um, it, with everything I do, I just have a curiosity to really understand everything. So the first thing that I did is I took a shoemaking class because I thought it made sense if I was gonna be designing shoes, I needed to understand what sh how shoes were made and what was inside shoes and what were the differences between quality a quality product versus a lower grade and also the materials involved. Uh, so I think it's important to really dig deeply into whatever whatever your product is. It to really become an expert of your product, and then to also think broadly in terms of your skill building. A lot of designers think, well, they just need to know how to draw beautiful pictures and that's it. Well, how are you going to bring it to market? How are you going to produce it? How are you going to understand how to price it, et cetera? So having a good business background was very helpful for me. After I went to design school, I went to business school and got an MBA degree. So that was really a key, to key component. But, you know, after I found the factory, I, I just uh, started testing my products. I actually didn't start with the factory I have now. I worked with different factories to test them out to see which factory I would ultimately stay with. And I think that that's also important to not just jump in and jump in so large, but take baby steps and, and to really test, test the waters to make sure that, um, that the connections are what you want them to be. Well, thank you so much for giving us that insight, uh, especially for young people getting started in a fashion career. Let's face it, there really is something unique about you. Uh, you're a woman of color, a black woman, and a black luxury designer. There's not a lot of you out there. What is it that you would point to as having uh, that experience? What has that experience been like for you? That's very true. And, you know, I'm happy to say that there are more than there were when I started. Um, when I started, I didn't know of any at the time. There, there may have been uh, some, but I didn't know of any Black designer that was in the luxury shoe space. And so what was that like? You know, for me, I felt a great level of responsibility to create an example of um, a Black woman in luxury Italian accessories. You know, I, I felt like I wanted to create a model and to, to really open that door. 
And so um, initially, you know, like I said, I didn't know anyone in the industry. I didn't have, you know, like a lot of people, they have an aunt or an uncle that can just make a connection for them, make a phone call. Um, I felt like it was very difficult. It was very difficult to navigate that environment and to figure out who to trust and who to work with and all that. Um, but yeah, and you know, the interesting thing is when I first went to Italy, uh, the shoe industry, there aren't many of us, period, in all levels of the shoe industry. So I was like that one brown girl, you know, at the <laughs> conferences, et cetera, meeting people, exchanging cards. And they always remembered me when I came back over and over again. So that actually helped me by being the unique person in the space. So I found that to be beneficial. Um, but as far as the product, I also had to educate my manufacturers on the anatomy of African-American women, how African-American women tend to wear larger shoe sizes, for instance. Uh, the form, which is called the last that shoes are built around, it needs to be comfortable. Um, I didn't want a narrow, tight, uncomfortable European last for my shoe line. So th those are some things that I had to consider in the beginning. And when you when you uh, mentioned how it is that that there uh, can be ethnic cultural biases in brands uh, with, with something as simple as uh, being able to be mindful about the types of feet uh, that uh, you're trying to accommodate comfortably. Uh, what what are, are are some of the challenges that you faced uh, as again a woman of color in this space uh, in terms of just getting your brand out there? Uh, I know that we we hear about people of color sometimes hiding their hiding their face on their products uh, and and needing to do uh, things that the mainstream, if you will don't even think about in order for them uh, to actually build their brand. Are those kinds of challenges ones that you've been familiar with? Absolutely. You know, because I was in the luxury space and, and, I'm, and I mean all products from clothing to shoes, just being black period in the luxury space, it, it's just a challenge because you're presenting a quality product and people aren't used to seeing someone that looks like you that has a company with a quality product. So I had to um, push through that stereotype constantly. Hmm. In the beginning, you know, when I was um, I was speaking to a woman who was giving me advice, uh, she had been in the fashion industry for years. And she advised me that if I want to have a successful luxury product, then I should not show a picture of myself on my website mm. because she felt that that would deter people from buying my product and not just people, black people. Mm. And I just, I, I, I never thought that I would have to um, just make those kinds of decisions in the beginning. Um, that that really took me aback. Uh, ultimately, I decided to show my picture anyway. Um, but just the fact that people of color have to think like that, you know, how we present the perception of your brand based on the fact that you are black and you have to manage that. That that is really uh, something, first of all, that I think needs to shift because, Absolutely. you know, there's there's a certain percentage of um, us that, you know, will only buy certain brands because of one reason or another. Um, but I think we all have to change the way that we, we value, that we value the things that we wear and buy. You know, I think that we bring value. We, we, we already have value and we have to know that um, instead of just buying brands because uh, for the wrong reasons. 
and and I think that when you um, so certainly when you said what you just did, um, it, it's kind of it's kind of sad when you think about it. And I agree um, that it has to change, especially it was kind of shocking to hear you say that uh, this counselor that you were speaking with said that even black people might uh, think differently about the maybe the quality of your um luxury line if they knew it was a black person who was the designer. Uh, and that really speaks volumes um, to uh, self-image, uh, self-worth. Like you said, we have to recognize that we are valuable. And um, as we know, black folks spend money. And so it is absolutely, absolutely the case that it's absolutely the case that we have the influence of the dollar if we would uh, stop to think about how important it is uh, for us to move beyond what sometimes we've internalized from the external concerning our own value and the quality that we bring uh, to the marketplace. Uh, so that was that was really an important tip. Can you give us any others that, let's say that you've got a, a young person uh, in the audience, and, and certainly there are who are listening, what tips, what advice, what encouragement uh, would you give folks who are thinking, I want to I want to follow in uh, her footsteps? What advice would you give them to help them find success? Well, first of all, I would just really encourage them to, to just own it in the first place, believe that they can do it and know that they're supposed to be in the space. You know, it's it's difficult when you're a minority in a space to feel like you belong there. So I think that that's the first step. And second, to do your research, do your homework, study other brands, uh, really educate yourself on the, the quality and the level of materials that you want to uh, present in your line. And um, just do a lot of um, connecting in the country that you want to manufacture in. I mean, I would never advise someone to um, do business by phone when you're dealing with another country. You really need to go there and look the person in the eye, inspect the factory, know what kinds of workers they have, and uh, really test the product before jumping in. And what about when you get a door that's closed in the industry? How, how, how have you hung in there? Uh, sometimes the doors are closed simple because of discrimination, because of of you you you've got the your your ethnicity, you've got your gender. How do you handle those doors being closed? You know, I feel like that's a part of being an entrepreneur is the ability to pivot and the ability mm -hmm. to know how to get through those doors. And if you can't, to create another door. <laughs> or make it happen, you know? And, and that's just what I do. And that's what I've had to do over the years. If something doesn't work out, ultimately something else will, um, but you have to stay in motion. You know, sometimes there are things that happen and I just, ha I just need a minute, you know, to kind of regroup, but you have to get back to it and you have to just keep taking one step at a time and you will ultimately get there. And I believe that that door was closed is a door that you weren't supposed to go through. It's because there's something better out there. And that has always happened for me. And that is, so, I mean, uh, that that advice is is worth the price of admission today. Uh, the time that is spent uh, uh, because it, it really is empowering. It goes back to what you said about being empowered not to think small. Uh, there is a way, find it. Uh, if a, a one door closes, it, it was because another one is open for you somewhere else. You got to find it. So you said, keep moving. Uh, and, and I think that that is so critically important. I just got a, uh, another minute or two uh, before I hand off to my co-host, Lango Dean. So let's talk technology for just a quick moment. You said when you were first getting started, the internet was not uh, ubiquitous like it is today. But technology has changed a lot since uh, you started your line. You launched, I think we heard almost a decade ago, or you're in your 10th anniversary. So how has technology uh, become a lever for you as you have uh, evolved uh, with your design and your, your line? Well, I have definitely 
evolved in that respect. And, you know, I think technology is really crucial, especially for African-American designers and business owners, because we tend to be less funded than our counterparts. And to me, technology bridges some of that gap. For example, just recently, I um, implemented a new service on my website where customers can go on and uh, check the status of their order themselves if they'd like to, or the return process is now self-serve if they choose to do that, or they can call us. Um, and what that does for me is that allows me to take my staff and to utilize them in a more valuable way. Um, instead of having to, to do things that uh, can be automated in some respects. So it kind of unleashes uh, the opportunity to create more value in my company. And in the beginning, you know, um, one of my friends, she still jokes with me to this day. When I first started, I started doing events in person. And my very first event, I had this like written receipt book and I just, I did everything <laughs> by hand. And I pulled out this receipt book and she looked at me, um, my friend Chandra, and she was just like, what are you doing with that <laughs> receipt book? Um, Cause she's such a techie. So she got me on board and you know, she got me with a nice, uh, she got me connected to a POS system um, where I, had an upgrade. I upgraded my checkout process. But since then, I've really understood that technology is really the key. You know, I started in the beginning when I marketed my business, I had an email list. So the big thing was just collecting email addresses and sending emails to promote the product. Uh, so now it's more social media. So, you know, and, and it's important also to keep up with the changes. When you think about how quickly things change, keeping up with them can be in and of itself a huge undertaking. Uh, and so from the manufacturing to the website to the um, the POS system to the uh, even apps, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, of ways that technology is brought to bear in business today. And it really is, I think, instructive uh, when I hear you say that when you um, are not in the position uh, to necessarily have net the, the same level of backing as uh, some of your counterparts, being able to close that gap using technology is huge. We're going to continue into our next segment and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more of the conversation uh, with uh, Tori Sedan as Lango Dean takes the reins now and keeps the conversation going. Hey, Lango, how's it going? Very well, Dr. Vaughn. How about you? I'm just great. Thank you. You're listening to High Tech Sunday featuring Dr. Mark Vaughn, Lango Dean, and our special guest, Artist, visionary, and owner of the Tori Sudan fashion brand, Tori Sudan. Registration for the 2021 Women of Color STEM Conference is now open. Stay tuned for a message from our sponsor. Running from October 7th through the 9th, 2021, don't miss out on the upcoming Women of Color STEM Conference. Since 1995, the Women of Color STEM Conference has been the premier forum of choice for recognizing the significant contributions by women in STEM fields. General registration opens on April 30th, 2021. Don't miss out on the opportunity to meet and learn from executives who are committed to the advancement of women in the workplace. Again, general registration opens on April 30th, 2021. We hope to see you there. Please visit www.womenofcolor.net for more information. Again, 
Registration for the 2021 Women of Color STEM Conference is now open. So visit www.womenofcolor.net for more information. Now, back to the show. Welcome to the show, Ms. Sudan. It's a pleasure talking to you. You know, as I listen to you uh, share your experiences with Dr. Vaughn, the last bit kind of caught me because I was thinking the tape measure is such an is such old technology, but you have to know how to read it to be able to design whether it's footwear or or fashion or accessories or packaging. It's old technology, but it's made new all the time. And a lot of people don't think how technical textile making is, fashion designers or footwear designers. They really don't think that is technical at all. They just think it's very artsy. So I'm gonna flip the question a little, a little bit because you're an alumni of pa Parsons. So if, if you're talking to someone with a GED or high school diploma today, what would you say in terms of, because like you said, there isn't an HBCU that has all the things that an FIT does, Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and Parsons does. But if you were talking to a young person today and you had to make a choice between Parsons and FIT, how would you tell them to choose? What would you tell them to look for? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I just spoke with a young lady just a couple of weeks ago, and she was in the process of making a decision on whether or not she should go to Parsons or go to Howard University. And that was an interesting question because I feel like, you know, there are other skills that you need even before you get into the design business in order to be successful in this field. However, if you look at the choice between the two schools, FIT and Parsons, they're actually both excellent schools. Excellent schools, but maybe not giving you that HBCU experience. So do you think Howard gives all of it? Well, she was looking at a business program at Howard. So I think that that was a key route for her to take is to really develop a strong business foundation uh, while she had the chance to attend an HBCU and to learn about the importance of what it is that she's about to embark on and to really uh, solidify her purpose and to get to know herself and to, to really be able to um, dig deep into her, her culture and um, get a strong business foundation. I really felt that that was important uh, because you can always later on go to Parsons or FIT and add that to your educational background. You were very lucky because you had, first you went to Spelman, then it was Parsons, then you had a, I think it was a Tommy Hilfiger internship, and then you went abroad to Italy, which is, probably the Mecca <laughs> for fashion. For a young person starting out today who's interested in fashion, uh, interested in, in design, textiles, footwear, accessories, what have you, packaging, making toys, what have you, what would you suggest in terms of what they should know when it, when it comes to knowing things that are technical, when it comes to knowing things that are biz business related, what are the little things that you should know, the, the building blocks that you need to put in place starting out? Well, I'll use your example with the tape measure because that was a really good illustration. In footwear, although there's a lot of technology that can be used in order to develop your line, it's still important to understand how to draw because software sometimes can limit how creative you can be. And so you want to be able to, to know how to draw the shoes, but then later you can incorporate different software programs um, like 3D modeling programs are great because it also helps you reduce your production costs. So I would say the two first learn how to draw very well 
and then to find the technology that works for you in order to present your line. Um, because it's important to present your images very clearly to the factory. A lot of factories tend to be very literal when they produce your first prototype. So if you draw a line that's off, the line on your shoe is gonna be off as well. In terms of business, a strong financial foundation is crucial. Understanding balance sheets and income statements, cash flow statements, um, how to cost your product, how to build in your profit margin. And if you're manufacturing internationally, you also know, need to know about currencies and how that impacts your costs. Um, so finance is really a key component. I'll just recap some of those tips again, learn how to draw. It's amazing that you said that because I remember a couple of years ago, one of our Black Engineer of the Year award winners, he the car designer, and he was asked, well, you know, tell us what we should tell young people. And he said, the most important thing I tell them is learn how to draw. So he draws cars and you draw clothes or, and shoes. But as a designer, that's the first thing you think of, learn how to draw. Uh, you also said, find the tech that works for you, because when you have to present your drawings or whatever, uh, your prototype, um, you have to find the right app that would sort of make it shine and get the financial foundation, understand numbers, understand arithmetic, get, you, get, get your math right. You also talked about mentors. You said that you were, a lot of times, you were the only black person in the room, the only brown girl in the room, I, I think you said. So when it came to mentoring, where did you start? I know you said a lot of people were very friendly and when you, they remembered you when you went back. Um, of course, you made a good impression, I'm sure. But when it came to mentors, mentors who stayed with you, what were some of the most important lessons that you learned from them? Well, since I didn't know anyone in the shoe industry, I thought more broadly about mentorship, which was helpful. Uh, for example, I was mentored by someone that was a CPA. So, you know, he really helped me on the business end. Um, I was also mentored by someone in the clothing business. While it wasn't shoes, it was also, it was also the fashion industry. So I think it's, you know, if you can't find a mentor that is directly related to the product, um, that you're trying to launch. I think um, it's good to be able to find um, diff mentors in other fields that can give you the content that you need in order to make your business successful. Basically, you said find mentors. If you can't find a mentor that is exactly in your field, find mentors in other fields that are kind of connected to what you do. So for instance, you found a mentor that was a CPA because of course, that you needed someone who could teach you the business side of your business, right? You also said you found a mentor who was, I think, in clothing, in, in the fashion industry. So I, I think you, you covered that. Um, but, but what were the important lessons that you learned from them? What did you take away from those mentors? Of course, they were slightly different things, but fundamentally, what did you take away from all of them? You know, I'll also say that one of the things that um, is important for, for me, I was also mentored by my factories. Uh, so, you know, my factory representatives, they have a lot of knowledge. So I went in and asked tons of questions. I asked them to explain the process to me. I've seen my shoes made and shoes made multiple times to really understand. And so what I really took away from all of the people that I interacted with as a mentor is just to really think deeply about what it is that you're manufacturing, to really try to understand. Instead of just taking someone's advice, you really want to understand, you know, the root of their advice. For example, my factory, you know, they always say, you know, you want to make sure that you use a certain quality of suede. Now, I can just take that advice, but to understand it is another thing you know, uh, because a good quality suede has longevity and it would increase the integrity of my product. So for me, it's just really understanding why the advice was given and to, to really um, implement it after understanding it. 
that's really key, understanding the root of your advice. Because it's not someone can tell you something, okay, do this. But it's like you said, someone told you, okay, use, use sway, but knowing why you have to use sway, that the, the product would be used longer by the consumer um, and that it would look better, wear better, and, and all of those things are important. Um, you, you taught business along, uh, along your career journey. You've taught business courses to students. What values did you teach uh, in that course? And you probably mentored some of your students. Uh, what, you know, what did you share with them about mentoring, about finding mentors in the industry? Well, I taught finance at Morgan State University, uh, which was a wonderful experience. And actually, many of my students were entrepreneurs at the time or aspiring entrepreneurs. And so it was just so rewarding to be able to give them, you know, that key component of any business is that strong financial foundation. So yes, a lot of them, you know, I, I mentored many of them. And a lot of things that I share with them is, um, first of all, like as an instructor, a lot, some students, you know, they're in school, they just, they just want to pass the class. You know, they don't really want to learn. They want to learn what it takes to get an A <laughs> versus really learn what it is that they're going to need in order to be successful. And so I really try to give them what they need to be successful and how to process the information that they were given and not just uh, know how to get an A, but really understand to be able to, to dig deep into the financials and work with the ratios and see the trends versus just knowing how to solve an equation. Mm. Dig deep, learn how to dig deep, see the trends and giving people what they need to be successful. I think those are the three key, key, major key points. My last question before I turn it back to Dr. Vaughn, if you could set up a fashion school at any HBCU today, where would you go? Don't say Spelman. <laughs> um, huh, that's a hard question. Well, I know that Howard has um, an existing fashion program and many students who are interested in fashion um, attend Howard. So I would probably say Howard. Um, also because they have a really strong business school. And so that combination um, of having that right on campus uh, would be important. But I would say Howard. Perfect. Thank you very much. It's been fascinating talking to you, Ms. Sedan. I'm going to throw it back to Dr. Vaughn. Dr. Vaughn. Hey there. Thanks a lot, Lango. And, and again, uh, Ms. Sudan, it's just been riveting hearing about your journey and the tips and the guidance that you're giving have been really greatly appreciated. And it's an insight that I know is really cool for everybody who's listening to receive. We're not done yet. We got just a few more minutes and, and one I have a little bit of a, a lighter hearted conversation, maybe. Um, uh, I'll go off script just a little bit real quick. So uh, help us with a reality check. Uh, needless to say, if you're like me, when uh, we heard Brandon uh, mention in the introduction that you had done a stint at Parsons, uh, we got images of Heidi Klum and Tim Gunn and Project Runway. Uh, so, so give us a reality check is what we see on that kind of a show. Is that really what designers do? Absolutely not. <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is a great question because I had that reality check. You know, when I got into the business mm -hmm. and I started my brand, I found myself doing things in the beginning, like packing and shipping, um, quality control, you know, I was like, you know, around a bunch of shoes and cardboard boxes and taping and, you know, moving packages. I mean, everything is involved in it, especially in the beginning. You know, I, I really, in the beginning, I did everything in my business from start to finish, including building my own website, just everything. And it was definitely a lot of work. 
and it did not feel glamorous at certain times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for busting our bubble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's important. I think it's important uh, that because we do, we look at we look at that kind of work that you do as glamorous. Certainly, the the output um, is glamorous, but the the work is real. And uh, so you have accomplished some pretty amazing goals. Undoubtedly, uh, you've worked with some amazing people. Tommy Hilfiger actually has a a connection to my hometown of Elmira, New York, by the way. And you're still not done, obviously, um, as you are looking at celebrating this uh, 10 years of your own uh, line. But what would you say is the top of mind highlight of your career so far? It's so hard to pick one. It really is. I mean, there, there are several things that I really appreciate, you know, one being having my shoes on the Tamron Hall show. I mean, that was just an amazing moment. One of the things that was really touching to me also is Viola Davis. You know, she gave me a shout out on her social media page. And, you know, what I felt um, in those moments were really being seen as a designer. You know, and I mentioned in the beginning how, how hard it is for Black designers to really receive the credit for their work and to have the, those moments where, you know, my shoes were on Tamron Hall, Viola Davis, and when Zendaya wore my shoes on the cover of InStyle magazine, you know, just to be in a place where my shoes were on the cover. It's just amazing to see how things have changed over the years. For sure. That is awesome. That is awesome. And and I'm telling you, I'm I'm just grinning from ear to ear uh, because the the hard work has paid off. And and again, I I'm sure that that's not why you do what you do. Uh, but it's got to be gratifying um, for people to recognize. Yeah, this is actually legit. Um, and you've already said my product is coming out of the same uh, facilities as the the Chanel's and others and so it, it's it's of that same caliber and and uh, to be recognized for it has got to feel fulfilling um, so let's get to it we want to make sure we got just a minute or two left can you give us information your how do, can people uh, get connected you've mentioned your website I know that you're on social media for sure can you just tell us how we can get connected uh, to Tori Sudan and uh, and everything about your fashion line sure well I'm on all social media at Tori Sudan uh, Facebook Instagram Twitter and uh, my website is torisudan.com. Great, great. I can tell you for sure one person who is going to be checking that out really quickly. Um, uh, and, and I know I won't be alone. Uh, could you uh, do us the honor as we wrap up this conversation and just give us some closing words of encouragement as we're thinking about passion. Uh, yours is certainly in the area of fashion, but it's bigger than that. It's all about doing what you were called to do. Can you give us some, some words of encouragement about kind of living that truth ourselves? Yeah, you know, um, I think that you really have to not only identify your passion, but the reason that you're doing it, you know, and, and it has to be greater than, than just making money or, you know, being famous or anything like that. You know, for me, what really motivates me every day is just knowing how creative we have always been as a people and have gone unrecognized. You know, I mentioned that my mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, they they designed beautiful things and made beautiful clothes, but you know, no one ever wore their labels, for example. You know, they made clothes for others and made them look good. And that has happened um, a lot throughout history where we've always been so talented, uh, but anything that we have produced hasn't ever been on the level of luxury like it should be. It has not received the honor that it should have always received. 
And that is why I do what I do every day. That is why I've chosen the luxury space. I really want to elevate the creative talents of our people. That is such a great note to end on. Um, I think that, uh, again, uh, for those of you who are not seeing uh, what I'm seeing, everything about Tori uh, Sudan from the line that I'm just getting a glimpse of is Lux all day long. Uh, and so I'm excited to have had the opportunity to uh, make your acquaintance and for the High Tech Sunday family to get to know you. And uh, we wish you all the best as you continue along this journey. And we're excited about being able to be the beneficiaries of uh, the uh, reality of your, your vision having come to pass. So thanks a lot. And uh, we're going to hand it back over to Brandon Newby to take us out. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of High Tech Sunday. Career Communications Group's High Tech Sunday looks at professional development and technology through the lens of spiritual philosophies. In a time when digital information is more critical than ever, this weekly program is produced by and for CCG's community of alumni and professionals in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. The community runs from national thought leaders to aspiring students, and this weekly series aims to bring a concentrated discussion around technological advancements and achievements based on universal moral principles. The one-hour podcast will be streamed every Sunday. The podcast can be accessed through the Bay of Facebook page, Women of Color Facebook page, and CCG YouTube page, in addition to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, and Spotify. Please join us next time. It's time to get your nominations in for the Bay of STEM Awards. The honorees will be recognized at the Bay of STEM Conference held annually with a community over 10,000 strong that focuses on celebrating excellence by showcasing career opportunities and professionals in the STEM fields. The 36th annual conference will be held on February 17th through the 19th, 2022. Please visit www.ccgheroes.com for more details on our nomination process to make sure nominations packets have everything it needs for the upcoming Bay of STEM conference. All peer review nominations are due on August 31st, 2021. All Outstanding Achievement Awards are due on October 1st, 2021. Again, please visit our website at www.ccgheroes.com for more details on our nomination process.